Well, anyway, I'm, I'm here to address a topic that is near and dear to my heart, and if I finish it in the allotted time, you will have witnessed a genuine miracle in chapel, and that is to explain the entire Christian religion, why Jesus Christ is the way of salvation in 30 minutes or less. Okay. And to do that in an apologetic series is for this reason, is because First and foremost, when we talk about Christianity, we don't want to relegate it to mere opinion. You should not follow it if it's not true. Bottom line, if it's not true, then all of us should be somewhere else. But the fact is, it is true. And there are multiple ways to defend the faith. Uh, there are philosophical ways. There are legal ways. But my specialty as a professor of theology and law is one of the ways is a doctrinal way. And you have probably been trained in your churches on how to do evangelism, on how to do you know, basic apologetics, you've had basic Bible classes, but one of the things about the faith is that well explained, it simply makes sense. And it makes more sense than every other world religion. It makes more sense than every other philosophy. It makes more sense than every other cult of Christianity. It just has that ring of truth to it. And it actually answers all of the problems that you have. Because when you think about what you're going through, what the world's going through, and I want to set it up real quick here, is that you all know that things are not the way they're supposed to be. That we all have problems. Maybe you don't, it's everybody else that's causing problems for you, right? It's called sin. Things are not the way they're supposed to be. And what do we long for as human beings? We want love. We want justice. But there's a, maybe you didn't have the right parents. Maybe you had the wrong boss. Maybe you just things have happened to you and you feel hopeless. You feel lost. And then you believe a false philosophy that somehow escaping it, rescue, deliverance, out of that domain of darkness is gonna rest on you. That's false. The true and the living God is a God of hope and a God of grace and a God of mercy. And Christianity is the only religion that teaches that it's all God doing the work. And he gives it to, it, gives it to us as a gift of grace. So what I wanna do is give you a, an overview here to show you the explanatory power of the Christian religion. And to do that, we want to start with all the way back in eternity. Because the, the title here, it says, Jesus Christ, the only way to eternal life. Subtitle, the theological coherence of Christian particularism. Meaning that it just makes sense that Jesus is the only way to salvation. So let me start with this with a statement from John 14, 6. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. He's excluding everyone else. Jesus is not an inclusivist. Jesus doesn't believe in pluralism. God is not a pluralist. He doesn't think other religions lead to him. We gotta get that straight. Why go on missions if there's another way? Why go out and help people with the faith if there's another way. We do it because Jesus said we have the only message of salvation and the apostles echoed that in Acts 4.12. There was no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, Jesus Christ. You either believe that or you don't, but the Bible clearly teaches that. Now, here's some common objections to this. Maybe you've, you've dealt with this, but people say Jesus is the only way. That's just arrogant. You've heard something like that before. Yeah, how in the world is that arrogant? You know, part of learning apologetic technique is to put the burden back on people that make assertions like this. Explain to them, define arrogance and how does this fit? We don't think we're better than anyone else. We just received a gift of God and we're thankful for it and we're offering it to you. That's it, it has nothing to do with arrogance. Or how about, it's so unfair. Another big apologetic objection to the faith. What about the people who haven't heard? Well, th the Bible is clear about that as well in Romans 1 and Romans 2. People are not judged 
because they haven't heard about Jesus Christ. They are judged because God wrote the law in their hearts and that they suppress the truth and unrighteousness and break his law. So God is just in punishing sin. God is just in upholding his righteousness. They're not being punished for not hearing about a pardon that's available to them. They're being punished because they've freely sinned against God. Now, I, I give you an analogy here. I teach constitutional law. I'm a lawyer, but don't hold that against me. Uh, I mean, you think about this. Think about this. Well, the only reason that those people on death row are being put to death is because the governor hasn't given them a pardon. Excuse me? Now, the reason they're being put to death is because they have a, committed a capital crime. The fact that whether a governor gives a pardon or not, that's within the discretion of the moral head of the state. But it's not owed to anyone. But see, we've got to get our reasoning correct here if it's going to make sense to us. Now, third objection, Jesus is the only way to eternal life. It doesn't make sense to me. Well, you know what? Add that to the list of all the other things that don't make sense to you, Okay. And then the question is, is that, have you actually tried to understand this? Or are you hard of heart, stiff-necked, and don't really get, care much about what God is saying? Now, think about this. What is salvation? Because this is going to tell us why Jesus Christ is the, is the only way of salvation. Now, I teach in world religions. I teach in cults. I teach in the area of you know, demonology and the occult. And you find out that there's a lot of false religions. There's only one true religion. But if you have the wrong goal, you divine salvation wrongly, you're going to have a wrong means to get there. Let me explain. And think about this in worldview thinking. Pantheism, which is not that Peter Pan is God, okay? That's not the Disney heresy. Pantheism is the teaching that everything is divine. All is one. All is divine. That's about a third of the world that believes that. Okay? So what is salvation in pantheism? Because why are you lost? Why are you having problems in this life? Answer, you forgot you were God. So what's salvation? God remembering he's God. Because you're already God. But if you're already God, why are you going to a temple to worship? Why are you trying to become something you already are? If you're already God, start look in the mirror and start singing how great thou art, okay? Because, and see, that's why people know they're not God. It's counterintuitive to do that, and that's why you have to chant, you know, take drugs, do everything to try and fake something. But, like I said, if you're already God, then what do you do with sin? Sin's not real because God is all good. It's an illusion. That's about as counterintuitive as you can get. You all know sin is real, and it's harmful, and we all don't like it. We need to fix sin, not pretend it doesn't exist. But a third of the world that holds to these pantheistic systems have to pretend it's an illusion and that everything is already divine. So scrap pantheism. Polytheism, okay? Many gods. Well, here's the problem. Which god do you follow? Zeus, Apollo, what if you don't like Zeus's ethics? Do you go to Hades and now you're right because you're under Hades jurisdiction? See, you end up with a relativism that doesn't fix the problem. Atheism? Uh, yeah, right, okay? Even the atheist can't help using the word design. You ever turn on like Animal Planet and these evolution shows? And they talk about how evolution designed all these things. I, I, my kids always know I'm screaming at the TV all the time. You can't say that. If you say design, it means there's a mind. It means there's an intellect. It means there's a will. There's intent. There's teleology. Balls of dust don't think, and they don't intend. And if you are an atheist, everything is reducible to a great big ball of cosmic stardust that accidentally clumped together. That's it. But see, how is that meaningful? How are there any shoulds or oughts or intention or justice or love or morality in that? Because everything is reducible to that ontology. Stardust blowing in the wind, accidentally clumping together. And if that's true, have a Three Stooges kind of life. Eat, drink, and beat Larry for tomorrow you die. Okay? 
That's it. Those of you who remember the Three Stooges, okay? You can do the curly shuffle afterwards. But for that, the point is atheism makes no sense. They can't even help using the word design, and every single thing is meaningless. It really is if atheism is true, but the atheists don't believe that. So you end up in a worldview structure, really with theism and ultimately Christian theism. Now I'm going to spend the next couple of minutes here and give you a quick outline of the argument on why Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation, it's the only way to make things right in life. Think about the purpose of life. Why do you exist? Why did God create you? Because I'll tell you, we talk about salvation being the gift of God. The first gift of God that you have and you need to recognize is the gift of creation, that you exist. God did not have to make anything or anybody. The triune God, that there's one God who is three persons simultaneously, was in an eternal, righteous, intra-Trinitarian love relationship forever and ever and ever. He did not need anyone else to complete his love, his happiness, his joy. He created us knowing we would sin, knowing he would fix the problem, knowing that we would be rebellious against him and decided to make us anyway. That's the gift of God. So your very, your very existence is the first gift, much less salvation. Maybe you've read in the Bible is to be an imitator of God. Okay. Well, think about what that means to be in the image of God, functional and ontological. God had to make us enough like himself so we could love, so we could appreciate righteousness and morality, so your joy could be made full. You know it, and, and I, I know you, you're, you're looking at each other now, going, hey, I want to get married someday. I'm dating someone. I want someone to know everything about me and to love me and accept me and that I can have joy, fellowship with, in my life for the rest of eternal life, okay? That's the kind of marriage you want. Those are the kind of people you want. That's the kind of family you want. Everybody wants that. You want to be happy. You want to feel significance. Guess what? If you're an imitator of the Trinitarian God, which we see in the Garden of Eden, how did God make man in his image? He made them male and female to functionally relate and love. See, to be an imitator of the triune God is to love one another in righteousness and community. That's it. What if Unitarianism were true? There's a big difference. What's, it, what's Unitarianism? There's only one person who's the creator God. That's what we call liberalism, right? Okay, there were a bunch of liberals. Now, what does it mean to be an imitator of the Unitarian God? What has God been doing for all eternity in the Unitarian world? sitting around all by himself with his hand on his, his chin, spiritually speaking, thinking important thoughts all by himself. So for you to be a perfect imitator of God, what's the highest form of imitation? A monastic life going off by yourself, thinking important thoughts by, by yourself. And that's why Jesus said, by this all men will know you are my disciples, if you can explain the metaphysics of the Trinity. But it's not in there. Don't, don't check for that one, okay? By this all men will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, and you will have shalom. You will have peace with your creator. You will have peace with your fellow man if everybody practices that, and that's how your joy is made full. Righteous, loving peace. Now, so it all starts with and ends with relationship. It's not realizing Godhood. It's not becoming God. It's not merely escaping wrath. Salvation is having a loving, peaceful relationship with God and your fellow man, which is what we saw in the Garden of Eden. So what do you, is your goal as a human being, much less a Christian? Try and get back to the Garden. Try and get back to paradise. Try and live like we ought to live so we don't have broken shalom with God and our fellow man. Because it hurts. People hurt us. We hurt other people. We're unsatisfied in this life. We seek something greater. Every human being has. So how do we do that? When we look at the garden, we see that the, the standard for this, you know it, 
be holy for I am holy. That's said in the book of Leviticus. It's repeated in Peter. Your job as a human being is to be holy 24-7, 365 days a year, never failing. For you to exist in that covenant relationship to enjoy the harmony and love of community, you need to be holy. But what's the problem? <clears throat> you're not, okay? And you know that. And if you're honest with yourself for half a second, you know you're not the person you're supposed to be. I'm not the person I'm supposed to be yet. So what does that mean? We start out in covenant relationship with God as human beings, Adam and Eve in the garden, and then it's broken. Here's a big question, and here's something I want to think of. Does God have to punish sin? Here's, the Bible is clear that God is holy, that he's immutable, that he's just, and that if God did not hate sin, he would not be a good God. If you look at Psalm 5, verse 4, and there are a number of uh, texts here. I will put this outline online for, uh, on my faculty website if any of you want to download it and take a look at it. If you get insomnia and you need to sleep at night, you can download it and read the outline here. But Psalm 5, verse 4, I mean, there's a lot of statements in the Bible about God's holiness, but in the Psalms, there are some particular ones that give us cause to pause. 5 4, for thou art not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with thee. The boastful shall not stand before thine eyes. Thou dost hate all who do iniquity. Habakkuk 1 13 says, God's eyes are too pure to approve evil. He cannot look upon wickedness with favor. Now, I want to show you why the wages of sin must be death. It must be separation from God. Because when you think about what it means to be holy, what it means to have fellowship, born-again Christians are the only people on the planet with a right moral compass, according to the Scriptures. If you're, sin, if, you're, if you're broken in sin, you have a bad heart and you don't have the Holy Spirit. You're going in the wrong direction. You have the wrong inclinations. Jeremiah says, the heart of man is evil and incurably sick. Who can understand it? Okay. Here's the problem. I'm going to give you an example here. So I want to show you why you would be naturally repulsed by sin. One of the things I did in my career is I uh, clerked at the Court of Appeals drafting criminal law cases for a justice there. And two of the, again, unfortunately, dr dealing with criminal law, you see a lot of the real yucky stuff in life. That comes from the Latin yuckiest maximus, if you want to look that up. So, but two of the cases I worked on, and I, and I am saying this for effect, one of them was a baby murder case. Some, some drunk, habitual drunk, didn't like the baby crying in his house. Six-month-old baby took the baby up, slammed him on a concrete floor, and murdered him to, to be, keep him quiet. Second case, 288.5 of the penal code, continual sexual, continual sexual abuse of a minor under age 14. Twelve-year-old girl been in foster care for a number of years because her mom was in drug rehab. Got out of drug rehab, got her kids back, and started shacking up with another druggie who was in the program, who was on, in rehab as well. Well, guess what? When mom went to her rehab meetings, the boyfriend was raping the 12-year-old daughter for a two-year period. And, of course, after two... But the girl didn't want to say anything because it was, she just got her mommy back. She didn't want to be put out of the house again. And, of course, finally it came out at school, and the guy got arrested. And uh, appropriate justice was done in that case, I can assure you. But I say those two things not just to be salacious, but to show you that I, I can see by your body language you had a natural repulsion for that. Could you ever be indifferent to that? Could you ever look upon that and be, eh, who cares, baby murder, not baby murder? No, you must be repulsed by that as a good person. How much more does the perfect holy one necessarily be repulsed by sin? He has to say, I can't have fellowship with that. I can't look upon that with favor. 
And until you understand the holiness and the necessity of divine justice, you will not understand the grace and mercy of God that's so amazing. God must hate sin, just as we must hate sin. But we also must love mercy and kindness and forgiveness because that's how things are restored. So there's an absolute necessity of divine justice grounded in the very nature of God. The result, three problems that we have. Guilt, alienation, and corruption. James 2.10 says, you violate the law at one point, you're guilty of all. Guilt. We stand guilty before God's bar of justice. Alienations. Colossians 1.21, so we're, we're alienated from the life of God. We're created to have fellowship with God, but we're alienated. We're not enjoying that fatherly, mentoring, loving relationship with God. And there was a change in human nature. Our hearts are bad now. They're selfish. We're self-inclined. Or as Martin Luther, the great Reformation theologian, said, the heart is curved in on itself now after the fall. We're self-centered. Therefore, our thoughts, our choices are all self-centered. We need a change of nature. Jeremiah says, the heart of man is evil and incurably sick. Who can understand it? And that leads to what? People looking for hope. How do I fix the condition I'm in? And think about this. If you didn't know about Christianity and you acknowledge this, you'd go nuts, that I'm guilty, alienated, and corrupted and didn't know about a remedy. That's why people invent false religion, which comes down to let's present, pretend God doesn't exist, let's pretend sin doesn't exist, or let's pretend of what I'm already doing is good enough to make up for my sin. Almost all the false religions fit into that. But here's the common error of all religions, okay, except for true Christianity, is that you can do enough good works to make up for your bad works. But what was the error of Cain offering up his works to God rather than sacrifice? What were the errors of the Pharisees? What were the errors of, you know, you go on and on, the false religions. They're trying to do enough good works to make up for their bad works. Here's why that's impossible if salvation is forgiveness and reconciliation to God. Now, I give this example because this is real life stuff. This is how everything in life works. It's all about loving relationships, either with your friends, with your family, with your spouse. And forgiveness and reconciliation only works one way. Okay? The Bible says that Romans 4.15 that the law brings about wrath. And the Bible is also clear is that by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. It must be by grace, and here's why. Okay? I'm not going to go into all the particulars of remuneratory and retributive justice at this point. We'll save that for another time. But here's the point. If you think you can do good works to make up for your bad works, that is what is called a super arrogatory act a work over above what is required by which you can accrue merit to pay for your bad works. That's a lie. Why? Because what is your job 24-7? Be holy for I am holy. You want to maintain your relationship with someone, you have to be righteous all the time. How many times does it take for me to be mean to my wife to break shalom with her? Once. And that's happened once or twice, okay? If I, now, this is only a hypothetical, but let's say one day I came home, I was in a bad mood, and I said, you know, honey, you're ugly and your cooking stinks. That's never happened. It's a hypothetical. <laughs> I would necessarily have broken shalom with my wife, okay? Now, here's the problem, okay? And she would, she would be harmed. I am the offensive party more often than I'd like to be, but she is the offended party. She's been harmed. Our shalom, our covenant, our relationship has been broken. How do I restore that? What I do then is after I've offended her that way, harmed the relationship, treated her in, a, in an unkind manner, then I go take out the trash and say, you need to forgive me because I took out the trash. She'll look at me and go, that, that's loony, okay? Well, yes, it would be loony. That, that makes no sense. Or 
you need to forgive me because I went and helped the little old lady across the street do some housework. What has that got to do with us? Okay? And again, on a broader scale, how do you maintain a harmonious relationship with other covenant communities, like the laws of the state of California and the laws of the United States? What's your duty? Keep all the law all the time, and you'll remain in a complete harmony with the community. Only one is enough. Now, let me give you an example here. What if, okay, let's say you were late getting a chapel here, and you decided it's a red light, nobody's coming, you run the red light. And then our great offices of the law pull you over for safety reasons and ticket you. And then you go before the judge, and the judge says, how do you plead? And you say, well, not guilty. And he says, why? Did you run the red light? Oh, yeah, I did. I was late for chapel. And uh, he says, I, I'm trying to get something here. You ran the red light, you admit it, you're late for chapel, but why aren't you guilty? You got to understand these things, Your Honor. Right before I went through the red light, I went through 10 green ones. And right after that, I went through 10 green ones. Hey, man, I got a 10 to 1 ratio of green lights to red lights. Okay. Now, see, we laugh, but that's what every world religion is trying to, to proffer to us as a way of salvation, that God will forgive us. How about try this in your classes sometime? Not really. Hey, you know, yeah, I didn't turn in that paper, but I turned in all the other ones. Therefore, I shouldn't be penalized. But see, that's the thinking of, of offering what you should have done in the first place, the standard, the law, to pay for what you broke. See, you laugh because it's so foolish, but that's what Islam does. That's what contemporary Judaism does. That's what Hinduism does. That's what Mormonism does. That's what Jehovah Witnesses do. On and on. That's what all of them teach in one form or another. But it is simply incoherent. It's even laughable to offer that when our standard is to be right all the time. So, since we're basically, once you've broken the law, there's nothing you can do, that's the, end, that's the bad news, okay? And by the way, that's what we need to preach. The entire Bible is a statement of law and gospel. We're commanded to have righteous obedience for our sake so we can enjoy shalom with God and our fellow man. What's the problem? That, that justice thing. See, so the wages of sin is death. God must naturally separate us and be repulsed by it. You're naturally repulsed when people are offended. Now back to my analogy about my wife, which is a hypothetical. I never really said that. How am I ever going to reconcile with my wife how are you going to reconcile with a friend you've offended? Here's how it's going to happen. Real salvation, which is forgiveness and reconciliation with someone. That's salvation. Salvation is to, with God is his forgiveness of our sins, and we're reconciled so we can walk with God in fellowship and love. How do you get that? Simple. How do I reconcile with my wife? She has to be willing to bear the harm that I've caused her and not hold it against me. That's what forgiveness is. So she bears my burden, bears the harm, and chooses not to hold it against me. She is a vicarious satisfier of my sin against her. She's willing to take that burden, willing to take that harm for me. What do I have to do to actually reconcile? Repent. I actually thought it was okay to sin at one point. I need to change my mind. Metanoeo, you need to change your mind. Reject the evil and now love the good. And do what? Confess. Acknowledge the harm. Be in agreement that I was wrong. And then as not meritorious works, but symbols of my repentance, cooking dinner, flowers, all those things, what do I do? Say, honey, tears coming down my eyes. I'm so sorry I said that. How could I have treated you that way? And she sees the symbols of my repentance, which are the outer symbols of my interchange. And she does what? She says, I forgive you. Hugs, kisses, and now we walk together in shalom again. That's how all relationships are fixed, and that's how God is going to fix our relationship. Now, to do atonement and salvation in two minutes, okay, this is it. How does God do it? 
What's, what's the wages of sin? Death. Can God die as God to bear our burden because sin must be punished? No. So how does God as the offended party bear our burden while still being God when the wages of sin is spiritual and physical death? Answer, Christmas. He takes on a full human nature so he can live a perfect life, die spiritually and physically for us, actually bear that burden, okay? So we get, so Christmas takes us to Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday, God actually bearing the burden, vicarious atonement or penal substitution, substitutionary satisfaction. How do we get it? Because we can't do it ourselves. That's pretty simple. The Bible tells us, by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. So Mark 1.15 says to repent. Mark 1.5 says we need to confess. And then, of course, we say, if anyone receives him, to them they have the right to become children of God. And what's the result? Where we were guilty, where we were alienated, and we were corrupt, because of what God has done, he does what? He gives us a new nature. You're a new creation in Christ. You're born again. He declares us not guilty based on what Christ does. And by the way, that's, you know, we, we think about that. Getting let out of prison isn't necessarily what we want. We also want to become part of the family of God again. So what's the other remedy we have? Adoption. We're made children of God. And because that Christ has paid the price for our sins, Christ is God incarnate. Christ is the offended party. That's why he's the only one who can pay for sins. Only God can do this because he's the offended party. You see the logic of it? Only the person you've offended can forgive you of your sins and bear that burden. Third parties don't count. So, you know, I offended my wife, and some guy walks up, starts clubbing himself in the head, saying, okay, everything's fine over here. See, third parties, that makes no sense. But so that's why we talk about the theological coherence of Christian particularism. It's just that. It's the only thing that makes sense, given what salvation is, forgiveness and reconciliation to God. The question now that I have for you is this, is that have you been relying on your works? Are you fearful that you're still not good enough? You haven't done enough? If so, you are that person who's believed the lie that you have to go through enough green lights to make yourself acceptable to God. That's a lie. You do not have to live in fear. You do not have to live in depression over that. What we need to do is realize that God himself became a man, made an infinite atoning sacrifice for what reason? So he can provide us that amazing grace of forgiving all our sins and adopting us. And all we can say afterwards, whether unbeliever, coming to Christ anew, or whether you're a Christian and you've got some sin in your life you need to deal with, God's already your father. God is there with open arms and is already ready to deal with you and forgive you and to give you the intimacy that you crave. What do you need to do? Listen to what the Holy Spirit's saying right now to you. Repent and just come to God and say, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Amen. Let's pray together, and then you're dismissed. Father in heaven, maker of heaven and earth, we love you, and Lord, it is such a privilege to be able to come before you and to understand why Jesus is the only way of salvation, and you've provided through him this marvelous work of grace. I pray that we would, as believers, continue to understand more deeply the gift of grace, that we would live without fear, that we would live knowing that we have been delivered out of the domain of darkness, that we are now spiritually alive, that we are now children of God, and all of that is given to us as a gift by you. Just help us, Lord, to be thankful. Help us, Lord, to have eternity in our hearts always, that we not focus on the mundane things of the world, that we would make the most of our time for the days are evil. So, Lord, thank you for Biola. Thank you for giving us this opportunity in a free land to congregate and to talk about your word. 
And Lord, help us to unselfishly go out and preach the good news to all who need to hear it. And as we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, you are dismissed. Thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.